Thank you for joining today's webcast on sustainability and affordability of public pensions despite the COVID-19 shock. My name is Hank Kim and I'm the Executive Director of NC PERS. Today's program is part of our expanded Center for Online Learning. As we all adjust to the new COVID reality, please bear with us if there should be any technical issues or unplanned background noise during our session. As always, your patience and understanding is appreciated. We encourage audience participation. Please submit your questions by using the GoToWebinar portal. However, to ensure that we can cover all our topics today, we will hold your questions to the last part of the program. Additionally, in the handout section, you will find a PDF of today's presentation, as well as the reports that it's based on. Our presenter today is Dr. Michael Kahn. Dr. Kahn brings with him more than 30 years of research experience in public pensions and state and local tax and economic policies. After his retirement from the Ed National Education Association, he joined NC PERS as Director of Research. In 2014, Michael developed the Public Pension Funding Forum to examine the obstacles that stand in the way of closing public pension funding gap and explore new solutions to overcome such obstacles, including better risk management in economic cycles, use of new and improved debt instruments, and closing tax loopholes. Welcome, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, and I want to thank everybody who is on the uh, today's uh, webcast. Uh, special thanks to those, those of you who are on the front lines every day. You are really our heroes. So everyone, please stay safe and stay well. Uh, we wanted to make uh, today's uh, uh, webinar conversational. And so Hank is going to ask me questions. I did prepare some slides, uh, which, which I think uh, in some cases uh, show more in terms of graphics to make a point. Uh, is a little bit more helpful than just having a conversation. So it will be a mixture of both. So we'll begin with the, the question from Hank for me, and then uh, we'll go over some of the slides. Yeah, Thank you, sounds Hank. great, Michael. Yeah, let's get started, right. So listen, uh, we often hear that public pensions are unsustainable and unaffordable. Uh, with your research, uh, you're saying that they are sustainable and affordable. Can you explain that? Uh, yes, of course. Thank you for that question. Uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, let me uh, begin uh, with the points on this slide, especially uh, people who say very frequently the public pensions are unsustainable and unaffordable. So I studied uh, why they say that and it seems to me uh, first i mean they manipulate assumptions and come up with uh, huge uh, pension liability estimates uh, of course if you change some of the assumptions uh, you will get a, a different estimate uh, number two they compare uh, and this is an important one they compare the 30-year pension liability uh, numbers with one year state and local revenues. And you may have heard uh, some people talk about Illinois, for example, the, the liability uh, is about 300%, uh, that's the next point, 300% uh, of uh, state and local state revenue, state gen uh, own source revenue. And uh, that is you know that's a scary number but if you uh, look at 30 year revenue and 30 year liability should be compared with 30 year revenues so if you compare the, the translate the same numbers that they are talking about in illinois the the uh, liabilities uh, are 300 percent of uh, state revenues uh, then you come up with a number that's much smaller. It's only about 8%. If you take the revenue of, uh, let's say, there's an example for, uh, where they made this case in 2017 that uh, the revenues were $67 billion 
per year and the liabilities were 240 billion so if you take that just one year's number then it's of course about 300 some percent of revenues but if you take 30 year revenue this 67 billion per year revenue times 30 and it's going to be even minimal growth in revenue over time you come out with only about seven percent of uh, liability is only seven percent of uh, revenues so this is pretty misleading and uh, of course nobody questioned that so they keep going on saying uh, well, this is pension debt is unsustainable, unaffordable, uh, they ignore. And the, uh, the other thing, uh, uh, they to make their point about unsustainability uh, of public pension is that they sort of ignore the economic and revenue impact of public pensions. Uh, they, that's missing from the whole uh, equation. And in the end, of course, you know, this, their pensions are, public pensions are unsustainable, unaffordable, therefore we should change that, convert them into a defined contribution plan. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so our research and why we say public pensions are sustainable and affordable, we uh, examine the relationship between pension liability and, and economic capacity of state and local governments as measured by GDP, gross domestic product, or you can measure it by personal income. Uh, so that's the difference between their approach uh, and our. And of course, state economic capacity is really what matters. Uh, the revenues we'll talk about later on, but uh, you know, uh, it that that should be looked at in, in comparison to uh, uh, capacity uh, of the state and local governments, economic capacity. Uh, and this approach was recently out, outlined by researchers from Federal Reserve Board of Governors, Bank of England, and Brookings uh, Institution. And they have emphasized or underscored that as long as the ratio between pension liability or pension debt and the economic capacity or GDP is stable over time, then the pensions are sustainable over, over time and affordable because they are in balance. So if they are stabilized, then uh, you know liability is growing, but uh, economic capacity is growing too. So it, if they are in sync, uh, parallel to each other, then it's uh, affordable and sustainable. So that's really the two ways of uh, uh, look. Both we look at it this way, and they look at it another way. Mm -hmm. I believe uh, this is a better approach than. Uh, so just to put a, put a finer point on it, Michael. Um, you know, I think all of our audience members are very familiar with the analogy that we use about, you know, pensions are like a mortgage, right? Like a 30 year fixed mortgage that mm -hmm. as long as you can afford the monthly payments, that the, the amount of mortgage shouldn't be that big of a concern relative to your one year's worth of income. And, and what you're suggesting is sort of a refinement or maybe the other side of that coin, which is to say, when our opponents put up this big charge, large number, which is in fact, you know, sort of like the overall mortgage amount, that what you're suggesting is then to have an apples to apples comparison, then they, should, they shouldn't compare that to a one year's um, uh, worth of uh, uh, state's revenue or taxation, but it should be over 30 years. That, that's right. And that makes sense. Uh, I mean, it's exactly just like the mortgage. And if your capacity to earn, if you are a, you know, a businessman successful or a physician, or your income is certainly growing over time, also you can afford. You don't have to pay uh, the entire mortgage, uh, you know, in one year. 
it's spread over. And that's the same. So it's sustainable, affordable. They look at, I mean, banks look at it affordability when you buy, you know, get the mortgage in this fashion. Why are we looking at pensions affordability and sustainability and saying, well, this is due this year. Our only income is in Illinois. This was in 2017. The total revenues are 67 billion and our liability 30 years over 30 years is 240 billion so this is 300 percent of our revenues <laughs> and they're very misleading okay so yeah. let's let's uh, split up both sustainability and the affordability issues and let's look at them individually and let's start off with sustainability huh? so, and and ask you specifically you know our opponents love to talk in broad strokes and in generalities so let's let's be specific on our side. What yeah. evidence do you have that public pensions are sustainable? Uh, the evidence of sustainability uh, comes from a couple of recent studies uh, using data from public sources. And I'll talk about both of these two studies here at least. Uh, and, and the reason we used uh, use public, both of these studies use public data. And it's important to emphasize uh, many studies uh, making a case uh, pensions are unsustainable, sometimes use their own data. They collect themselves and they don't want to share with us. A good research should be replicable. So the data should be available to everyone who wants to uh, do the same analysis and come up with the same results. And so we have been using uh, this particular study by, uh, I mentioned uh, people from uh, Federal Reserve Bank. Uh, Jamie uh, is from Bank of England. Uh, Byron is from Federal Reserve Bank. Uh, and actually I should mention that, you know, this study was presented at our public pension funding forum last year. Uh, before it even became uh, well known in the uh, academic uh, uh, our pension circles. So this study again uh, looks at, uh, can you, next slide please. This, this was based actually on a sample of uh, uh, database that's available publicly at the, uh, from NASRA as well as uh, uh, Boston, uh, uh, center, Boston College uh, Retirement uh, cent, uh, Program. So this study shows that under low or moderate asset returns, because we are talking about, you know, in the future, we don't expect uh, very high returns. So they actually look at risk-free, some moderate and a uh, little bit better uh, return. Uh, so they use three assumptions and in aggregate, they find uh, for the U.S. as a whole, pension debt can be stabilized and sustained as a share of the economy with relatively moderate fiscal adjustments. With you know, it's really minimal adjustments, uh, so that the growth of the GDP is sort of in sync with the growth in the pension liabilities. So the next next slide, please. So this is my favorite uh, part of the study. Uh, uh, they conclude uh, that there appear to be only modest returns to starting the stabilization process now versus a decade from now. So there's really uh, uh, always uh, there's a, you know a sense of urgency. The sky is falling, and I really like this. Uh, finding that, you know, you don't want to just do it today. <laughs> uh, if you do it today versus make changes 10 years from now to begin the stabilization process, bring the two lines parallel between uh, GDP and the pension debt uh, through making changes or through making uh, additional uh, contributions, things like that. 
uh, it, it won't make a whole lot of difference if you did it today versus 10 years from now. So I really like this, uh, this finding from this study. Uh, next and Michael, slide. And Michael, yeah. can I just make a, or ask you a question to make a fine point? This isn't to suggest that there is no problem in, with public pensions. What, what, I, what this is really suggesting is that it's not a crisis that needs to be addressed immediately with one year's worth of revenue, for instance, that mm -hmm. have a timeline and a runway to address this. Is that correct? Is that a good that's, way of interpreting it? That's right, yeah. I mean, I think it's, there's no urgency. The sky is not really falling. <laughs> and I mean, there may be some plans, individual plans where you may have to do certain things, but you still have a long time horizon. And after 30 years, there's another 30 years. You know, you roll over. <laughs> Keep, it's not going to end uh, 30 years from now. The pension funds have been there for 100 years, and they'll be around uh, if we don't destroy them by uh, claiming the sky is falling and mislead, providing misleading information would be there for another 100 years. So I think that should be our perspective. Uh, and that's what the data shows. Good. Uh, okay. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, let's go to the next study. This is a study that we did at NCPERS ourselves. Uh, in tranquility, our turmoil, public pensions keep calm and carry on. And I think that's what you hear uh, from uh, uh, pension administrators, uh, uh, given the current situation, uh, COVID-19, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. So NC first study measures sustainability by comparing pension liability with GDP. And as long as I said, the previous study has done the same way, but they did with a sample, whereas we do for the whole country, for US as a whole. And uh, as long as liabilities are not rising faster than GDP, then they are sustainable. But if you only focus on uh, pension liability in no context, <laughs> then it's, you know, it's a problem, it's rising. Where it's, you know, pension liabilities are rising, but so is the GDP. Uh, so next slide, please. I think you can see visually uh, what's going on. So uh, in this uh, chart on the right-hand side, and we are making comparison, uh, not apple to apple, but just taking our opponent's approach, uh, compare liability with, uh, one year uh, revenues, but here we are looking at one year annual uh, GDP. So over time from 2002 to 2017, uh, this is data coming from a Federal Reserve uh, Bank and they estimate liability much larger than actually uh, uh, their method of estimation is little bit, it exaggerates little more than <laughs> But even then, look at the chart on the right-hand side. Uh, the blue line is a 30-year pension liability. That's the bottom line. And the red line on top is the annual uh, uh, GDP uh, uh, the economy. So they are moving, both are sort of moving, if you see, uh, parallel uh, almost. There are ups and downs in some cases in 2008, uh, 2000, uh, but pretty much you could say it's, it's, it's going in a parallel direction. And even toward the end of 2016, 2017, the GDP is actually rising faster, faster than the uh, liabilities. So it's, it's in, a, in, a, in a sort of parallel, uh, formation in this, as you can see the actual data, but we shouldn't compare it with one year GDP. We, as I said, you know, it's a 30 year liability. We should look at 30 year GDP. So the next slide, please. Let's look at the 30. Year. So here we go. <laughs> here you can look at the 30 year GDP for each year. And that's the top line. 
a red line on the chart on your right hand side and uh, bottom you can't even see the uh, liability the blue line it's almost uh, you know way down you had you need a microscope <laughs> to find uh, the the trend uh, so we let's put it under a microscope and just plot the ratio on the next slide so there is a trend here so this is the ratio between uh, liabilities and the uh, gdp and it's very very small of course 0.0010 uh, 0 0.010 goes to 10 uh, 014 so very small you really need a microscope to uh, look at the trend and that's what it will appear if you uh, uh, plot just the ratio of these. So if we want to make this a straight line, maybe take the average of that and make the whole thing, then we, it will be very small amount that you need to uh, add to make this line. Uh, some of it is below average and some of it is above average. Let's say 0 0.012 is the uh, sort of the average. So if we want to bring it down to the average to stabilize 100%, I mean, approximately it's not, it's okay, but if we want to be 100% sure to make it stable, straight line, you need about only about 0.12% of annual GDP. Uh, so that's really uh, a minimal cost uh, to, uh, to make the adjustments. And the previous study I mentioned, they are, their conclusion was that you could um, stabilize public pension liabilities uh, uh, with minimal changes. And even if you wait up for 10 years, it won't make a whole lot of difference to make those changes. Uh, okay. next. Great, next. thanks. Thanks, Michael. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so uh, obviously, you talked, uh, uh, you know, and I think very convincingly about the sustainability of public pensions. Let's focus on the other uh, part that we wanted to raise today, which is the affordability. So how did you go about examining the affordability issue? That's an excellent question. Uh, and I think the, uh, the way we look at uh, affordability is in our, one of our publication, NCPERS publication, Unintended Consequences, how scaling back uh, pen, public pensions puts government revenues at risk. So uh, in this study, uh, uh, there are many other things discussed, but one of the area we, which is very related to affordability is uh, how much revenue public pension funds generate, I mean, state and local revenues, tax revenues, uh, and how much taxpayers contribute to public pensions. And if you look at the next slide, it will show uh, the uh, blue line is the tax revenue attributable to pensions. And the red line shows taxpayers' contribution. And you can see the tax revenues that are generated uh, due to ex very existence of public pensions and taxpayers' contribution. There's a big difference, almost more than half uh, comes from, uh, is a pro sort of uh, more money than they spend. So that. I mean, if, if you are getting more than what you are paying, it's affordable <laughs> to me. Uh, and that's the case. And one would ask, uh, well, how could you say public pension uh, generate tax revenues? Well, there are two ways here we mentioned on the left-hand side, uh, actually on the, on the Next, because public pensions have economic impact, and when the ec economic impact in turn uh, produces revenues, when the economy grows, the revenues grow. Uh, 
Uh, so how do public pensions contribute to economy and revenue? Uh, let's look at the next slide. Next, please. So the economic impact, uh, there are two ways public pensions impact uh, the economy. Uh, first is uh, the investment of public pension assets. So there's $4.3 trillion when we had the latest data was 2018 invested. Uh, so investment creates economic growth. Uh, and economic growth creates revenues. So we're just going to look at the economy first. And the second way uh, public pension generate economic uh, uh, stimulation is by spending of pension checks by retirees. So there are two ways. First, investment. Second, retirees spend their pension checks. That creates economic positive economic impact. And you could actually measure that. Uh, in fact, there wasn't any methodology or no one had looked at the impact of pension fund uh, investments, assets, 4.3 million, 3 trillion <laughs> invested in the economy, what's the return? So we developed uh, a methodology to measure that, and uh, that I, I'll call it, uh, of course, it was vetted by with various uh, various uh, academic uh, experts uh, to make sure that you know we uh, our methodology is sound. Uh, so the impact of uh, assets uh, on the economy was about uh, 500 and we had done this study twice so in in 2016 it was 588 billion and in 2018 872 billion so we use the same data but more information becomes available uh, at later and we'll continue to repeat this study every two years when the date, new data becomes available and you same thing for the spending by retirees and on the right hand side you could see the impact over the over time actually a uh, blue line is uh, the uh, 2016 uh, impact economic impact and the yellow is for 2018 and you could see the impact actually increased for both the uh, uh, effect of uh, in investment uh, of assets as well as spending of pension checks. So each year you bec it became stronger, uh, more pronounced over time. Uh, next slide, please. So that's the economic part. Now, as the economy grew, that impacted the, re uh, go back to the previous slide. Okay, so the revenue impact uh, is measured in there and you have the, and you know this uh, report is available on our NCPERS website. But I pulled out uh, these charts from that to show you that the, uh, as the economy grew because of investment uh, of uh, public pension fund assets, uh, the revenue grew uh, also by 126 billion, and then in 2018 it grew by 178 billion. So the economy grew more, the revenues grew more. Uh, same thing for spending of retiree checks, economy grew more, revenues grew more. So on the right hand side, you could see again, the revenue impact also became pronounced over the two period that we had done this analysis. Uh, uh, the impact of investment of assets uh, has grown uh, the impact of spending of pension checks on revenue has also grown. So it's becoming even uh, better. So now we wanted to compare, uh, looking at, uh, next slide, looking at whether taxpayer contribution uh, and the impact, revenue impact of how did that change over time? Here you are looking on the right-hand side, uh, uh, public pension generated uh, more tax revenues than taxpayer contribution to pensions 
uh, both in 2016 and 2018. And the graphics, the blue line is tax revenues generated, total tax revenues generated uh, by the mere existence of public pension. And the red line is uh, taxpayer contribution. So even there, we have actually very pronounced difference over the last two, e uh, two years of the study. Uh, that is impact is becoming even greater. So if you are paying less and getting more in return, that's what I call affordability. And that's the evidence that public pensions are certainly affordable. The fact is that taxpayers can't afford not to have public pensions because if there are no public pensions, taxpayers will have to pay more. <laughs> the gap between the contrib contributions and the revenue coming because of public pension, that they'll have to pay ex that extra money to get the same level of services they are getting now. Uh, so that's really what the facts are. But of course, you hear from the other side that pensions are not affordable, but on what basis, I don't know. <laughs> Okay. Very all right. So very compelling, Michael. And so I would say, uh, you know, these studies are under normal circumstances. But obviously, given that we're doing this webinar uh, from our homes, it's currently not normal circumstances. So what has the impact of COVID-19 been on your uh, studies relative to sustainability and affordability? Sure. Let's look at the uh, next slide, please. So, uh, uh, how does COVID-19 shock to the economy impact sustainability? So, we look at the sustainability first. So, for the purpose of our analysis, we assume the uh, worst case scenario, public pensions will lose about 1.16 trillion uh, in value due to COVID uh, of their assets due to COVID-19 uh, economic shock. And uh, this was my estimate just using some data from Federal Reserve Bank and uh, looking at the drop uh, in the market. Uh, we, uh, uh, I think uh, Moody's came up uh, with a very close estimate of $1 trillion that you may have heard in the news media about that. Uh, so we found that cost to stabilize the ratio uh, uh, over the next 30 years will be only about 0.2% of annual GDP. Uh, so this is almost like a 40% drop will only cost about 0.2% of annual GDP, which is very, uh, very, if we want to make this line a, a straight line, that's what it will cost. Uh, but most likely pension funds uh, will make up their uh, COVID-19 losses as the economy and financial markets recover. In fact, uh, just looking at the S&P index, it has already recovered. Uh, I had uh, done some calculations. If So, uh, on March 23rd, S&P dropped uh, 31%. Uh, yesterday, uh, S&P is down only about 2.7%. So that's almost the 90% of loss in value uh, is recovered. And if, you know, I'm assuming pension funds didn't sell any, any of these assets because of the, the drop, uh, so if they haven't sold anything, they haven't lost anything, it's coming back uh, uh, from January 2nd uh, to yesterday, close of market, S&P is down only about 2.7%. And it's so, so they may recover on its own, but in the worst case scenario, if, if, they, if pension funds had lost, 1.16 trillion, that can be uh, 
stabilized. You can make this line straight as I was demonstrating in an earlier slide, and the ratio between uh, GDP and uh, pension liabilities over 30 years. It's only about 0.2% uh, of uh, GDP, annual GDP that could stabilize, but that won't even be necessary if the market would recover as it has happened over and over again. Pension funds are very resilient. They just keep going and making uh, adjustments to their portfolio regardless of market goes up and down in the last 100 years, uh, and they are still uh, doing pretty well. Uh, from our methodology, looking at the pension debt versus the economic capacity of state and local governments. So next slide, uh, let's look at the affordability. Uh, of course, as I mentioned, pensions are affordable because tax revenue is generated by pension fund investments and spending of pension checks by retirees is more than taxpayer contributions. So this is more important during economic downturns, actually, as pension checks keep coming when you know people are losing jobs and not having any income. Uh, similarly, pension funds being long-term investors continue to provide stability in the market when others, for lack of better, better term, run for the door. Uh, so we don't really have data right now to, to assess the impact of COVID-19 on affordability, what will be the impact on the uh, state and local revenue and contributions. Uh, but my my guess is that it will become more significant because this is a source of income, a source of revenues, and it's becoming more pronounced as other factors involved in economic growth and revenue growth are becoming uh, less important. So pensions are still the, uh, a, a source of uh, uh, of money that could be invested and impact the economy. So I believe they, they'll continue to be affordable. They will generate more revenues than taxpayer contributions, but uh, we'll need a little more, wait, wait a little longer to find uh, the actual data to examine that. So then Michael, you know, if they are affordable and sustainable in normal economic times as well as during the crisis, why do states have budget crisis? Uh, next slide, please. So pensions have nothing to do with state and local budget pressures, you know. Uh, budget pressures are the results of the way state and local revenues are structured. Over the years, uh, state and local governments have made their revenue systems regressive and more reliant on risky revenue schemes such as casinos, uh, lotteries, uh, excise taxes, user fees. So it's becoming regressive and also out of sync uh, with the economy. <laughs> Uh, as a result, uh, you know, if the economy grows, let's say economy grows by 1%, the revenues grow by only 0.75%. So you're losing like 25% of the, can't, they can't capture the uh, growth of economy. Uh, they lose about 0.25% uh, uh, that way. So it's, revenues will always be short. I mean, I have, last 30 years, I have worked in areas of taxation and uh, school finance and fun funding public services at my work at National Education Association. I was very involved in uh, funding of adequate and equitable funding of states and states that none of the states had ever had enough money to provide adequate and equitable funding for equal educational opportunity for children. Uh, so it's, uh, 
not having uh, the, the budget pressure will are there unless we fix them. And I think uh, uh, I should probably say that NCPERS has recently published uh, a, a paper uh, which includes tools that you can use to improve your revenue structures as advocates of public pensions or advocate of public services or public schools or public safety. Uh, there are step-by-step -step, uh, uh, things you can do, tools you can use to make it better. So if nothing changes, uh, state budget pressures will continue. Uh, there'll always be a shortage of revenues uh, compared to the needs. Uh, and even if there were no pension, these problems will prevail because the reasons are not related to pensions. They are related to something bigger than the pension, which is the state and local revenue structure, the loopholes, the all those things, uh, uh, subsidies, <laughs> and from which the money flows out actually from state that goes to the tax haven somewhere over in Bahamas or someplace like that. So that's why there are budget pressures. Well, I mean, I guess if you are an optimist, which I am, uh, maybe a silver lining coming out of this whole COVID crisis is a recognition by hopefully the vast majority of Americans uh, and taxpayers that, you know, state and local employees do have, uh, you know, value that, you know, over the last, you know, three or four months as Parents try to uh, teach their kids at home, and you know, uh, public safety and, and firefighters have been out, uh, and public health have been addressing this national crisis. That uh, that these things do not come for free, and that this incessant drive to minimize taxation actually have costs. And so, hopefully, one of the things we can learn as a as a country and as a society coming out of COVID is that if we want to ensure that our kids are properly educated, if we want to ensure that our public health system is robust, uh, that we need to invest. And in order to invest, we need to have, you know, you know, uh, good taxation and revenue structures for state and local government. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And uh, I mean, this study that NC first published, uh, uh, you know, lays out very nicely. I mean, uh, it, it's not a question of raising or cutting taxes. I mean, taxes should be stable. They should grow in sync with the economy. Uh, they shouldn't be high. They shouldn't be low. They should just be right to meet the needs of uh, society. Uh, and that's pos it's possible to do that, <laughs> uh, as the uh, uh, the paper lays out, uh, and there are tools we can use. So it's an important piece uh, for all of us who are advocates of public services, public pensions, that uh, we uh, uh, take uh, steps and write to our legislators, uh, talk to other people. I mean, that's the real problem. And I think uh, the trends are very disturbing uh, in yeah. the taxation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, good. Hopefully we can start moving that uh, conversation in the right direction. Yeah. So in closing, Michael, let me ask you, what inspires you to focus on sustainability and affordability of public pensions? Uh, well, uh, you know, I'm fortunate enough to uh, be part of uh, NCPERS. I believe strongly that, you know, everyone deserves a great pension plan. And as you look at this uh, chart, uh, on the left-hand side, uh, the percentage of uh, private sector employees in defined benefit and defined contribution plan during 1975 to 2017, and you could see the blue line is the uh, percentage of people in defined benefit plan. 
and red line is the percentage of people in defined contribution plans. So the left-hand chart, you can see it, it got reversed. <laughs> uh, the uh, number of people in DB in private sector went ooh, all the way down uh, to about two in 10. Uh, and now it's probably even less than that. Whereas uh, <laughs> moving to defined contribution plan is is uh, went up more than seven <laughs> or so. So that's one trend which is very disturbing, uh, of course. And does on the right hand side we look at the public pension uh, between 2010 and 2019. Uh, again, the DB. So if you are working in the in the public sector, you still have a decent chance of having a de defined benefit pension plan. Uh, and so actually uh, the, the, the data really shows that advocates of public pensions, uh, organizations like NCPERS had a pretty important effect by in actually increasing the percentage of people in defined benefit plan during 2010 to 2019, uh, the blue line. And the red line also increased because uh, I think it looks like there are people who also got both plans. You know, the, they, uh, some of them uh, in defined contribution as well as, so both of them increase, increase a little bit during 2019 without reducing the DB plan. So that's a, that's a good, good thing. And, you know, it inspires me to, to uh, sort of see this is such a good thing. Why is, why is this trend in the private sector and attacks on public pensions to uh, become like a private sector? I think both private and public sectors should be moving in the direction uh, of defined benefit plan because everybody believe I believe everybody really deserves a a great pension plan and NCPERS has been uh, instrumental in expanding uh, the uh, DB uh, uh, pensions uh, in the private sector also through secure cho choice program. So it inspires me to be part of this effort to preserve and promote uh, pensions. Right, well, we certainly welcome your uh, expertise <laughs> and your knowledge. Um, Michael, thank you so much for sharing your uh, research with us today. Thank and you. thanks for our attendees for joining us. Uh, please join us next Tuesday, July 14th, when we host our mid-year legislative update with Bridget Early and Tony Rhoda. Michael, thank you. Have a good weekend, everyone, and we will see you next Tuesday. Thank you.